Shad Ururu, Shad Muzuzu, Shad Mafuta, Shad Anointing. Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. First of all, I want to thank the person of the Holy Spirit for the privilege to be here. And also, I want to thank our most highly esteemed Papa Joshua Igila. Say, we love you, Papa. Praise God. I also want to thank you for making our time from work to be here. Amen. Now, we began by talking to us on a subject we began on who introduced condemnation. Yes, sir. And the Bible says there is therefore now. Amen. Yes, sir. Can you read it? There's therefore now what? It's in Romans chapter 8, verses 1. Yes, if you still don't know where it is now, that means you were not in the first class. Amen. It says what? There, there is therefore now. Now, 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 the mistake a lot of Christians make is that they see some of these verses of scriptures as memory verses. Well, the Days of it being a memory verse is over. Oh, wow. It should be a reality in your life. Amen. Wow. Yes, sir. It says yes, what? Sir. There is therefore yes, sir. now no condemnation, no condemnation to those who are in Christ yes, Jesus. Right? Yes, sir. It says there is therefore now no condemnation. Right? To those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. But like we told you, the expression, who walk not after the flesh, was originally not there. But that it was the Bible expositors that included it there because they believe that should be the opposite of walking after the spirit. Because again, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 into verses 17, it says, um, the, the flesh warreth against the spirit. And these are contrary one to another. Yes. Such that you, will not, you are not able to do what you should. Then it says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He said that in Galatians chapter 5. But there was a reason why he said that. But to the church in Rome, the reason why he was bringing these positions up was because really he was primarily trying to make them realize what can make them have an unadulterated faith. Because in chapter 1, he had told them, your faith, the testimony of your faith has been noised abroad in the whole world, he said, to which I have heard about. And I like to come and be part of it. But I like to highlight to you how this faith came about. It came through the gospel. And through this gospel, right, yes, the righteousness of God is revealed, yes, which is from faith to faith. And he was telling them these things. Why? Because he did know that there were certain Christian Jews amongst them who were still traditionally inclined to the laws of Moses, who were still tied. And having those folks in their midst, they could adulterate their faith. And the word faith there is the Greek word pistis, yes, which means persuasion. In other words, these, these traditions, these Jewish traditions could corrupt their persuasions that came through the gospel that they heard. It says, faith cometh by hearing, and the hearing is by the word of God. When did this, where did he say it? Romans 10, 17. So it was still to the Roman church. So to the Roman church, the focus 
was the tenant on faith. Right? To the efficient church, the tenant that he focused on was on forgiveness. You see that? To the church in Colossae, the Colossian church, the tenant of the gospel he brought to them was the deliverance from the powers of darkness that came through salvation. So to each of them, the church in Thessalonica, the primary focus was the resurrection, the, the, the afterlife, the joy of the afterlife. Because the church in Thessalonica really did experience a lot of death. Mm. So it was a way of giving them hope, yeah. which, is, which was true. And so when you gather all these various tenants to the Corinthian church, the primary focus was to, um, to win them out of the, the traditions of the world into the practical realities of the Christian life. Mm. So, what he really combated in Corinth was the issue of harlotry. Now, when we say harlotry now, it doesn't necessarily mean a man sleeping with another woman. The primary focus was that even though they were Christians, they were still heavily into traditional practice. So, they were the kind of Christians who could say, well, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And Paul says you cannot partake in the communion of the Lord and partake in the communion of devils. Yes, yes, so, you see, to each church, there were different tenants yes. he addressed, which was peculiar to their circumstances. And it was primarily targeted towards addressing the present distresses yes. in all these various places. Yes, to the Philippian church, it was really on blessing them and letting them know why he is still alive, that he was still alive for their sake so that they can prosper. The other churches were really not worth him being alive for because he had already given them leaders. Timothy was here. Titus was there and all that. But to the Roman church, the focus was on faith, trying to help them, encourage them to keep the unadulterated faith that had come through the gospel from his own spiritual children, Priscilla and Aquila, who were the overseers of the churches in Rome did have the desire, he did have the desire to visit the churches in Rome, but did not have the privilege to visit the churches in Rome. But he did go to Rome as a prisoner to be judged, to be brought under Caesar's judgment, but not necessarily to visit the churches. But it was a heartfelt desire that he did have for the churches in Rome to pay them a visit that never came true. It was a desire that never came true because he died without ever visiting the church in Rome. But he did write them letters. And he commended them. He told them what they didn't know. He said, your faith has been noised abroad. But be careful. He says, now there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And who was he addressing there in the church in Rome? The Jews. Because the part B of that verse of scripture says, For the law of the spirit and the, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a reason. Notice he didn't say in the name of Jesus. But rather, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Now notice, each time, one, thing, one of the things that will help you in your Bible study is that each time you see Paul make references to the law, just know he's addressing a Jewish congregation or a congregation that had Jews in their midst. 
He says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That remark alone will tell you that he was really addressing the Christian Jews in the midst of the church in Rome. He says, it has made us free from the law of sin and death, which they were familiar with. And the law of sin and death was the law of Moses, which was called in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, as the ministry of condemnation. And also known as what? The ministry of death. You see that? And he went on to say it had glory in it. But for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Righteousness. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9, it says, For the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, which is the law of Moses, right? Yes, Had glory in it, right? Yes. Then he said, But the ministry of the spirit, which is the ministry of righteousness. You see that? Had much more glory. So what he referred to as the ministry of the Spirit, he also called the ministry of righteousness. So righteousness actually is a spirit. Wow. It's a spirit that brings correctness into your life. Now, you need to understand that in traditional Christianity, there is the teaching that righteousness means the ability to stand before God without any sense of guilt, inferiority, or condemnation. As much as it sounds true, it is really not. As much as it is true, it was really not. Now, would you say Jesus was not righteous? Please answer now. You are not answering now. Was Jesus righteous? Yes. Okay, fine. Yeah, I know you are a Christian. But when you look at the life of Jesus, would you say you are more righteous than him? No. Yeah? Please answer now. Okay, fine. But, but the point here is that even though Jesus was called the righteous one, the just one, what happened at the end? The father turned his back on him. Right? Someone say, well, he was made sin. That's the point. That even a righteous man can still end up becoming sin. That would tell you that righteousness is not the ability to stand before God without any sense of guilt, inferiority, or complex. But rather, righteousness is a spirit. Because it was when the spirit left him, he cried out, why had thou forsaken me? The spirit of righteousness left him. And Paul said it. He says, if the ministry of the spirit, then he calls it also the ministry of righteousness. Go there so that you can understand it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9. I'm excited in my spirit yes, that the spirit of righteousness is at work in my life. You see that? It is all about the spirit of righteousness. This has nothing to do with your standing before God. Yes, Without the Spirit, you can't even stand. Because who's, who gave us the privilege to be called the sons of God? The, the same Spirit. Right? By the Spirit of adoption, the Bible says, right? We call God what? Father. In that same Romans chapter 8. So it is the Spirit that gives you what? The right of sonship. Which gives you what? Standing. And once that spirit departs, you have no stand. So you see why righteousness is a spirit? It's not about... It, 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 it. Let's give you another proof. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess, you already know the scripture, you can write it down. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. Amen. Thou shalt be what? Saved. Right? Then what did he say next? Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth 
unto righteousness. But what did you believe with your heart? The resurrection. Who rose Jesus from the dead? The Spirit. So you see, you can never separate the Spirit from righteousness because the Spirit himself is righteousness. His presence in your life is what makes you righteous. Right? So, when you confess the lordship of Jesus, question, what precipitated it? Do you confess the lordship of Jesus first before you believe that God raised him from the dead? Or you believe the resurrection first to confess the lordship of the name? You believe the resurrection first. Why? Because if he had not risen, the name would not be exalted. Right? So that means that righteousness precedes salvation. But what traditional Christianity preaches is that salvation precedes righteousness. As a matter of fact, it's salvation that gives you righteousness, they say. Then Abraham missed it big time because if you still claim you are the seed of Abraham, who was never a Christian one day, whose righteousness you claim you are under as a seed, and that will tell you that righteousness preceded salvation long time ago. And it was all the product of the Spirit himself. So righteousness has nothing to do with the standing of God. Standing before God, I mean, without any sense of guilt, inferiority, or condemnation. No. Righteousness is a spirit. It is the spirit that makes things right in your life. You see that? It is that same spirit that brings correctness. This was what was at work in the life of Samson. That was why Samson wanted to marry a Philistine which was in violation of the law. But the Bible said the Lord was behind it. So who was the Lord that was behind it? The spirit of might. The spirit of might. The spirit of might upon the life of of Samson made it right for him to marry a Philistine. Why? Because the Bible says the Lord saw it as an opportunity, an occasion to attack the Philistines. So that became the righteousness of the spirit. To marry a woman on falsehood with the intention of destroying her tribe, her race. And as far as God was concerned, it was right. But to the others, it was something that was wrong. Even to his parents, it was in violation of the law of God. But the Lord said, this one is right. Yeah. This is exclusive. So you see here, there is an exclusivity that works in the life of a Christian. Wow. You understand? Wow. Where, in a situation where some don't have access to certain things yeah. that you, by, by the spirit of righteousness, have been granted access into. And this has nothing to do with your qualification. But what precipitated it? What triggered it? No. Your belief in the resurrection. You see why it causes the spirit of life? Because you were coming out of the dead. Because we were dead as Gentiles. Remember? It says, but God who is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and verses 4 to 6. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and verses 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, with his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, did what? Raised us up. He did. And we believed it. And by reason of the belief in that resurrection, which is where our Christianity began or begins, we automatically what? welcome the spirit of what? Righteousness. So it frees us from any accusation of the law. Yes, sir. You see why there's no condemnation? Yes, sir. Yeah? Yes. What empowers condemnation? A command. Yes, sir. Or a law. We told you where there is a law or a commandment, there is condemnation. Every spiritual instruction carries what? Condemnation. And you will not know. The only way you can know that there is condemnation is when you violate the command. Okay. Now, we were explaining something to you. We said that, boy, I'm righteous, man. I'm righteous. Maybe you are not, but I am. 
I'm not trying to be, but I am. I am righteous. How do you know you are righteous? Because you believe in the resurrection. He says, if we believe that God raised him from the dead. He says, with the hard man, believe it unto righteousness. So being in righteousness, he said, man believes unto righteousness. So being in righteousness means being in the spirit. Because the spirit himself propels the direction of your life. Which is why as you obey spiritual instructions, that's the act of being in the spirit. Because Paul told them in Romans chapter 3, the righteousness of God has come outside of the law. The righteousness of God. Outside of the law. In Jesus Christ. Notice that. In Jesus Christ. Okay. And who was he talking to? The Jews. But in Philippians 2, we are told that for us of Gentile background, the righteousness of God came to us through what? Well, to the same Roman church, actually. Yes. Through what? Believing the resurrection, but acknowledging the lordship of the name brought us salvation. Yes. Now, you need to understand. Yes. But that the righteousness preceded what? Salvation. salvation. And righteousness is not post-salvation. It's not a package God gives you. It's not a package God gives you when you are saved. It is a package that brought salvation to you. Because until you believe anything, you cannot confess what you believe. True of us. Didn't the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you have to believe first before you speak. We're speaking to you what we believe. You may disagree with me. Well, you, are not, you have no business with my heart. You see? So if we can get into your heart, well, the truth of the matter is that we can't really get into your heart, but if we can get your hearing, your heart can be adjusted. But it all depends on not the speaker, but on you, the hearer. And so you choose what you want to hear. Now, I choose to believe what I've heard. That if I believe the resurrection, I'll be righteous and then acknowledge the lordship of the name. Which brings me what? Salvation. When you understand what we just explained to you, you will see why no matter what you did wrong, you did not lose your salvation. You know why people are afraid? Of losing salvation because they think if they lose their salvation they have lost the righteousness but the righteousness was what brought you even the salvation and it's easy to receive it believe the resurrection believe the resurrection but guess when guess the avenue many christians live in they believe in jesus you see that they believe in jesus which is even wrong that's even wrong because we're not told to believe in Jesus. We're told to believe the name. Eh? Yes. Confess his name and believe the resurrection. Is that not what Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt what? confess the lordship of the name, right? Did he say believe the name? No, But many are believing the name. And they miss it. And by believing the name, you automatically miss salvation. Because salvation does not come by believing the name of Jesus. But salvation comes by believing, by doing what? Confessing the lordship of that name. Why is believing the name not the required um, process to be saved? Because Believing the name does not bring glory to the Father. Philippians 2 verses 9 to 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart, 
that God raised him from the dead, right? Thou shalt be saved, right? But he says, wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, right? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things or beings in heaven, of things or beings in the earth, and of things or beings under the earth. And that every tongue should confess. That what? He said every tongue should, not may, nor would like, should. It's a sovereign instruction. Should what? Believe or confess? Confess what? The exalted name that Jesus is Lord. To what? To the glory of God the Father. So believing the name does not bring the Father glory. It is the confession of the name that brings the Father glory. Which is why the Father gives you in return the package of salvation. Have you ever asked people or have you ever wondered why do we really need to confess the lordship of Jesus? Have you ever wondered? Yes, sir. But you know, if you so say, because he's the Lord of our lives. No, 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 that's not the reason. It is because he rose from the dead never to die again. Because others that Jesus himself rose from the dead died again. But really, Jesus died and rose again, right? But there were others also who died and rose again, right? Because when you read Matthew chapter 17, Moses was alive, but he died. So he came back to life, right? That will make him equal with Jesus when it comes to death. But the difference here between Moses and Jesus is the fact that when you start reading from verses 5 of Philippians chapter 2, he says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. Now, this mind was not in Moses. Moses was under compulsion to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt and lead them. It was a compulsory assignment. He had no choice, but not Jesus. Jesus willingly did. He says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who though made in the fashion of a man, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, right? But humbled himself unto death. The humility of Jesus even to the point of death. And the Bible says, even the death on the cross. Why was the emphasis on even the death on the cross? Because he so obeyed and chose to be a cause. He obeyed and his obedience became a cause. God said, this guy deserves to be exalted. Moses will complain. Lord, am I the one who gave birth to these people? Read Numbers chapter 11. He will tell you, Lord, kill me, but not Jesus. Jesus so obeyed that his obedience even became a cause. And he made him be, he died a cost man. And what cost it? Obedience cost it. God says he, he deserves to be exalted. The name now, his name deserves. And if you study, one of the, you know people, it's unfortunate that Christians are still wearing spiritual pampas. They are waiting for mansions in heaven. They are waiting to go to heaven. But if you read the letters to the seven churches, the Bible did tell us some of the things God will reward you with. To some, he said he will give them a white stone. And out of the seven churches, he never promised any church a mansion. Not one. Not one. So it's better we break your heart now and tell you the truth. Because it will be a double tragedy when you get to heaven. And you are waiting for your plot. <laughs> Saying that my mansion, because you were lied to by your pastor, that there's a mansion for you, the vestibule is this. Oh, there are angels who are waiters wearing nice white robe at your service. You better, better wake up. That spiritual marijuana they give you in church, you should. <laughs> You should come out of it. Mansion. In your own lifetime, you did not even live in a mansion. So God will just look at you and say, welcome my precious child. As though you are the most valuable. Listen, let's tell you the truth. You know, preachers say, you are the most precious. Even if you are the only human being on the face of the earth, Jesus would have come and died. No, it's a lie. Jesus would not have come and died for you if you were the only person. One, you are not even a Jew. That's one. <laughs> Do you understand? Even if you were, Jesus specifically said that he only came for the lordship of the house of Israel. How about Judah? 
Remember John chapter 4? What did the Samaritan woman say to Jesus? The woman by the way, sorry. She said, the Jews, that means those from Judah, have no dealings with we, the Samaritans, who were called Israel. So, no matter how they stir up your emotions and say, even if you were the only person in the world, Jesus would have come and died. You. <laughs> you. <laughs> even the, the government of the nation where you live is already tired of you. They have not had, no nation under heaven has had an accurate census of all our citizens. Do you understand? They only give estimate. They never included you, so God will do it. Jesus will not do it and say, I, I, have, I have Brother Theophilus in mind. Brother Theophilus from, from Zambia in, this, in the town of Zamunda. You better wake up. Your government has not catered for you. It's Jesus that will come and do it. 2,000 years ago when there was no Zambia. When there was no Nigeria. There was no Umunede village. Right? Was, is there Jamaica in the Bible? <laughs> There was no Jamaica there when Jesus came. No, no, no. See, we can say some nice things about Jesus. Jesus told us. He said it in the Bible. I only came for the lordship of the house of Israel. Even when a Gentile came to meet him for help, what did he say to the woman? He called her a dog. He said, you are a dog. Yeah. Jesus. If he had said that to you, I know you want, you want to stone him. I know what, we know what you say to Jesus. You call me dog and they call you Messiah, stupid Messiah. <laughs> he called her a dog. The Bible says it's all God. God who is rich in mercy. He didn't say Jesus who is rich in mercy. He said, but God. And we ignore him. This whole thing was all God's idea. But we seem to push him aside and say it is all about Jesus. And God is just wondering. <laughs> Even in heaven, Stephen saw Jesus, right? Shortly before he died, right? Where was Jesus? Sitting on the throne or standing? Before the throne or the side? Why is he not sitting on the chair? Someone said, but Jesus said, you shall see the Son of Man seated. Didn't you notice what he said? He said, you shall see the Son of Man, not the Son of God. As Son of Man, he is the Son of David. So he will sit on the throne of David, not the throne of the Almighty God. Yes. Brother, no, you're made to. What did the angel say to Mary? He said, he will what? Sit on the throne of his father, David. Yeah. Is David the Almighty God? No. Jesus has still not sat on the throne of David yet. Now he wants to come and sit on God's throne. Brother, where are you coming from? Read your Bible, right? This mansion promise is confusing you. They promise you mansion. Mortgage, you have issues with it. So don't worry. So if man or corporations can run after you over mortgage, you think everything in heaven is cheap. <laughs> you don't understand. Even the new Jerusalem, to enter, they will screen you. Read Revelation chapter 22. They will, they will say, no liar. No liar. <laughs> no monger. Go we'll enter. So say, no, I don't tell lies. I'm already with God. Okay. God be with you. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9. If some who died for the sake of the testimony of Jesus were under the altar, they were not even given a bus quarter. They were not put in the lobby to rest. They said, give them white cloth. The white cloth will make them rest. Where? <laughs> under the altar. <laughs> so give them all white robes. Who lied to you about your mansion? Can you even manage one? That's another thing. It's true. Can you manage one? All right. Before, <laughs> before you say we denied you of heaven, 
Come back to the earth. <laughs> now, believing the, believing the name of Jesus, you know, because preachers say those things on TV, you have to believe the name. Father, I believe Jesus is my Lord. No, the belief was not towards Jesus. The confession is towards the name of Jesus. Why the belief is towards the resurrection. Why? Because the Father exalted the name. Now, we told you that condemnation. Who, what was the title of the lesson? Who introduced condemnation? condemnation? Because we need to know. And then we said um, in our last class that if you, if you are going to find out who did, you are either going to look at it from two angles. One, you're either going to, you are either going to look at it from the chronological arrangement on the, of the Bible, right? Yes, sir. Can you remember? Yes, sir. The chronological arrangement, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Number, Deuteronomy, down to Revelations, the way it was arranged. That's the chronological arrangement. But that is not the order in which the books were written. Because many think that's the order in which the books were written. And just because Genesis talks about creation does not mean it was the first book to be written. Rather, the oldest book in the Bible is the book of what? Job. So which means the book of Job was written long before Genesis was written. As a matter of fact, the book of Romans was written 10 years before the book of Matthew was written. And then the oldest book in the New Testament is what? The book of James. Yet, it does not begin the New Testament. You see that? So, we said, we are either going to look at it from these two angles. Either we are going to look at it from what? The chronological arrangement. Or we are going to look at it from what? The order in which the books were written. And by, such, by, by doing such, you'll be referring to what? The book of Job as the first book to be written in the whole Bible, yes. among the books of the Bible. Yes. And we said, going by the chronological arrangement, God, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, introduced what? Condemnation. Please answer that, right? Yes. Lord said, do not eat of the, of every tree in the garden, thou shalt eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. Amen now, right? Yes. For in the day thou eatest, thou shalt what? Yes. Die. Surely die, he said. Amen. Amen. Yes. Eh? Yes. And we said, Adam in Genesis 3 verses 8 said what? I heard thy voice, right? Yes. Genesis 3 verses 8. 8 to 10. I heard thy voice. Right? Yes, and I what? I, I hid myself. No, no, no. I heard thy voice. I was afraid and I hid myself because what? I was naked. God ignored the others and said, but who told you that you were naked? Now, now, why would Adam say a thing like that? That means he already became conscious of condemnation. It already began. And what did God query? Did you do what I told you not to do? You see that? Because for you to be in this condition, it was simply because you violated my command. Yes. To the children of Israel, condemnation was introduced to them through what? The law. But to Adam, condemnation came through a command. One. Just one finished Adam. Now, think about the children of Israel who were given over 250 laws. Adam was just given one. You now, you this Christian, you are not Jewish of any kind. No matter how you say they discover 25% Jewish blood in you, it's okay. But no matter how Jewish you want to claim, with the funny small hat you wear on your head, and the prayer shawl you cover yourself with, in this heat, <laughs> in summer, <laughs> no matter how hard 
you do it, you are trying to bring yourself back to the laws that brought condemnation to the children of Israel. And that condemnation destroyed Jesus on the cross. He killed him. He made him a curse. Even Jesus, people don't understand. You know, people think Jesus conquered the law. He didn't. Jesus never conquered the law. Couldn't. To this day, will never be able to conquer the law. What he did was he fulfilled it. When something is fulfilled, it is over, right? Yes. Does that mean you conquered it? No. no. If the thing is empty again, you start all over again. But he fulfilled it. He who said, I did not come to destroy the law. He said it. Matthew chapter 5. He said, I did not come to destroy the law. Because he knew he couldn't. With all the spirit of God that he had. With the power of the spirit of God at work in his life. He could not conquer the law. Rather, he fulfilled it. Whatever the law demanded, he gave it to the law. Right? So when they say Jesus paid for our sins, which sin did he pay for? Our sins. Your sins. What sin? Okay, so who did he pay? Satan, God, or the law? <laughs> Certainly it was the law he paid because it was the law that made him a cause. And the law demanded a payment. And the payment was that he was to be a cause so that everything would be fulfilled. And he met the terms of the law. Who brought the law? Moses. And he met him at the Mount of Transfiguration. So that was probably what they negotiated that day. Moses said, forget it all. You must meet our terms. You want to be Messiah? You must die. Fulfill our law. I was a victim to it too. Help us pay. <laughs> pay for all of us. And he did. How did he pay? With his life. By death or by being a curse on the cross. A curse on the cross. And when he became a curse, there was no need to live. He died. Okay. So. Okay. Man. That digression was great. But we hope you understood what we were saying. Okay. So. The law introduced condemnation to the children of Israel. God Almighty introduced what? Condemnation to, to, Moses, to Adam, sorry. Okay, now, let, let's go on the other side of it by looking at who introduced condemnation in the order in which the books were written. Starting with which book now? The book of Job. Now, go to Job chapter 1. <clears throat> now, there's something we're going to show you. I will amaze you, we believe. If it doesn't, then you are not here. <laughs> but if it does, because I, I think, I, I think. Okay, let's, let's. We think. No, no, I don't know. Okay, let's use. That's the better English to speak. We think that as a Christian, say it. Or let's say we recommend. That, that's, a, that's a better one. We recommend. Say it. To every new convert. To every new convert. To everyone who wants to know about God. To everyone that wants to know about God. Genuinely. Genuinely. If you really want to know about God. We will advise you to read the book of Job. Instead of Genesis. Because what was introduced to us in Genesis chapter 2. Was a mean God. Who enslaves people. Planted a garden and brought Adam and put into the garden. You know what that reminds me of? Slavery. Yes. That makes God a white man and Adam a black man. 
had a plantation and brought Adam. And you'll be amazed that that is also one of the things that empowers white supremacy. That God is white, actually. You are the Adam. Can't you see you look like him? Oh, you are looking all funny now. I know you are from Georgia, but you... <laughs> you see that? That God had a plantation and brought this African guy from the ground. <laughs> and now use the cherubim as immigration and say, leave our country. Go, 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 go. Go back to your country. In 2019, with one white house cherubim. <laughs> we say that respectfully, actually. So, you see, that doesn't really give the, the true picture of who the Lord God Almighty is to the glory of his name. So, I think the book of Job, being the oldest book and the first book to be written, gives you a clear cut picture of who God really is. Not like the one Moses portrayed in Genesis. And you don't blame Moses. And the reason why Moses wrote it from that perspective was because he was writing to a people who were already used to slavery. Don't forget, before Genesis chapter, before the book of Genesis, there was already Exodus chapter 3. And it was in Exodus chapter 3, Moses encountered the angel of the Lord who sent him to go and deliver the children of Israel. Until he finally did, there was no Genesis. So Exodus actually comes before Genesis. Because until Moses was called, he could not even see anything about the beginning to write. So he was writing the book of Genesis from the perspective of slavery to a people who were coming out of bondage. That the reason why they, are, they were suffering for 430 years was their rebellion. Like the way Adam was. So you see, you will be wrong now. Who was never a product of slavery? In terms of, I, see, I came from Nigeria. I was born in Nigeria. But I've never been a product of slavery. You can't, you will be stupid as a white man to tell me I'm a slave. I'm not. Because even in Africa, I was not a slave. Do you understand? I'm not, I didn't come to America because I was shipped here. I was not shipped to America by force. I came by choice and by divine mandate by God. So instead of being a, a slave to you, to you, I'd rather be a slave of God because God brought me here. Do you understand? So, so that's why even those remarks of, um, no, listen, we're trying to make you see something here that no matter what a white man tries to do to you, don't, don't try to see the person as a racist. After all, the person is not the one feeding you every day. Except maybe you have those kind of... Or maybe your mother's boyfriend is a white person. <laughs> but you see, the, 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 we don't know that you're getting what we're saying here. Because it's easy for a typical black guy to just say, we were a product of slavery. I've never been a product of slavery and I came from Nigeria. In Africa, I've never been. I walk on the street with confidence. I'm a success. I was not shifted to come and work in your plantation. You, do you know where I live? I live in a good place. Do you understand? And until you start seeing things that way, you always want to blame one ignorant guy who does not have the real information as, as a reminder of what happened to your forefathers. Do you know how your forefathers look like? You don't know that they deserve to be slaves. If you know how they look, look at their pictures. You go to the museum and see whether those ones deserve tie, tie and suit. But look at you today. Do you look like them? Certainly not. So what's your business with your forefathers? Well, you may be angry with that, but I've never, I'm not a, I've never been a slave. But you see, like we said, that, that picture of Genesis was... Moses was writing, Moses would be surprised that you read the book of Genesis because he never had us in mind. The whole intention was to a people who were familiar with slavery, who were in bondage. And he was trying to make them understand that the God we serve, if you don't obey his command, you'll be a victim of slavery. It was from that perspective. And what you read there should never affect your life in the negative. 
Rather, it should make you even appreciate God to say, man, I, I, that's God who is a boss. That God you read in Genesis chapter 2 is not a father. He is a master. He's a boss. And you are his slave. Working in his vineyard. That's what he's trying to tell you. That's the picture of who God in Genesis chapter 2 is. He's not a father. But here in Job chapter 1, we read about a God who provides. Who appreciates people. Who values people. Whether you know him or not, he's the one supplying your needs. That's the God to know. Leave Genesis chapter 2 alone. That's why they tell you you are homo sapiens, homo erectus. I know that. They take you back to Genesis. Don't tell, don't tell me that I look like homo sapiens. At least tell me I'm a relative of Job. So that, means, that means people will die. Do you know how many people have died in my family? I'm already used to it. <laughs> in fact, my salvation is a product of death. You don't understand? We were dead and then we were brought back to life by God's richness of his mercy. Because now, how can God be rich in mercy? Right? And great in his love towards you when you still have the picture of Genesis chapter 2 in mind. But when you have the picture of this God in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, you definitely appreciate the mercies of God. Because as long as you have the picture of Genesis chapter 2, you will be thinking that Jesus came to save you from a wicked God who looks like a white man who enslaves people. So people see Jesus from that light as the one who came to deliver us from the oppressions of God. After all, God was the one who gave the Jews the law that they broke. But that was not the case. Job was a guy who was never given any law. God was just blessing him. I like this kind of God. I, I don't like the one in Genesis chapter 2. Just for eating one thing. Whether it was orange, don't think it was apple. It's a fruit. So it can be guava, it can be orange. Before you start looking at this apple and say, it's too red. It looks like the one Adam had. No, this one is too green. It was no apple. The Bible never said it was apple. It was a Roman Catholic ideology. You don't even know whether the peach you just finished eating was actually the issue. The Bible only said fruit tree. You didn't tell us which fruit. Okay. So we say thank God. And you thank God that I mean I don't eat fruit. One say, well, but also you are discouraging people from being vegetarians. This vegetarian, this vegetarian, this that you are carrying. This gospel and the righteousness of vegetarian that you are carrying. Ask Adam. It cost him dearly. <laughs> I like the God who encourages us to do party. Yeah. Those children were having party. They were grooving. I know you will tell me I'm no longer a Christian. It's okay. <laughs> Go and be a vegetarian. Genesis chapter 2. That's a vegetarian God. Yeah, I don't like that one. And that one will tell you, brother, see, I didn't come for you. <laughs> I like this one. Providing for you yet. Yes. You didn't even know him. Do you know what Job said? He said, I've been hearing of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye see thee. So you did not know him yet. This one, whom you did not know was supplying, blessing you. This guy was an owner of estates, had slaves working for him. I like this kind of God. Who bless this kind of Job? Job's wife told him, curse God and die. God never said anything to her. But Eve, just brother, come and eat dinner. Problem. <laughs> uh, uh, well, please. So I say, brother, see. I don't know the way you are coloring my mind. I didn't color your mind. <laughs> because now, obviously, we're already used to it. They say we always, we always confuse people and we bring satanic gospel. Okay. You think about it. With the way you live your life, if the God of Genesis chapter 2 pursued you, imagine if he knocked at your door, whether you'd have made it through. Be honest. <laughs> No, be honest. Before you came, you know what you did already. Before you came here. Imagine if the God of Genesis chapter 2 is after you. He will be able. <laughs> okay. Job chapter 1. I like this God of Job. 
No, it's not for you. It's for me. In Genesis chapter 2, there was no Satan in the picture. Just one serpent. Yet, <laughs> there was curse on the serpent, curse on, on Eve, curse on the ground for Adam's sake. But in this one, there was Satan. There was no curse on Satan. There was no curse even on Job. Job was the one cursing himself. <laughs> this same God was just neutral. Oh, I like this kind of God. The God of Genesis chapter 2 was for the Jews. That was the God Moses introduced them to. That's not your business, really. But you want to know, so you have known. That's why we say, if that God of Genesis chapter 2 visits you, he needs blood on people's door so that he can protect them. Until he sees blood, you know. Is that not the voodoo God? But well, let's continue. <laughs> <laughs> for Job he protected him without telling him to give sacrifice or slaughter anything even Satan testified of it he said you, gave, you placed a hedge around him jo without Job's knowledge God protected on our ears I like that God man. Job did not need to pray God pray, even when all the prayers he was praying were unnecessary Satan is testifying I, I, I like this kind of God that will bless you where Satan will be talking about you your success is frustrating them. Yes. Wow. Not the kind of God in Genesis chapter 2. What's more, just for eating dinner that wife gave him more. Was it because you, you listened to your wife after she gave you, before she gave you food? Get out of here. And you will never read, in spite of what Job's wife did to Job, you will never read that she ever labored to give birth. Exactly. It was still the same woman. <laughs> Which God are you looking for? Well. No, 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 it's mine. I don't know about you. <laughs> well, you sound offended now. <laughs> hey. Do you know how I feel? I feel that my Christianity just started. Let me get to know this God. I'm telling you, man, this should have been my business. One. I should leave Genesis alone. Man. <laughs> but it's good to know it. And guess what? When, when they even want eyes, ah, see how, how terrible you parents must have been. You want to, your children, joyful children, peaceful, innocent children, they sit on your lap and you want to read Bible story, you start with Genesis chapter 2. <laughs> and the child is wondering. Ah, ah. Then you're not telling your child, for eating Adam ate apple. The next time your child, well, you even offer your child apple. Put it in her lunch bag. She went to school. She brought it back. She did not eat it. <laughs> because you planted that seed. That if she, if, she, if she ever eats apple, God will chase her away. And yeah, you, the father who told her that story, or mother, still put apple in her lunch bag. Or give her apple juice. Anything apple. She says, Why are these parents doing this to me? <laughs> Uh, introduce them to this God that Job knew. Yes, wow. true. And Job was not a Jew, a Gentile. Let's know this God. Yes, and you can't say Job went to hell fire. Okay, Job chapter 1. Are you in Job chapter 1? Yes, sir. Will you be kind enough for us to read together? Yes, sir. Or should we close now? Let's read. One to go. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. One that feared God and hated evil. Read. And there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Verse 3. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and three Now, church history reports that Job was a contemporary of Moses. So, which means if Job was the greatest man in the whole East, which will include also Israel, that means Job, uh, Moses was still in Africa, in Egypt, while Job was already reigning. Now, 
Did you read here? That here we were not told God blessed Job with 7,000 sheep and everything. No. But he had it. He had it. Now, we're about to tell you something. What Abraham needed to obey God to have, Job had it naturally. He didn't need to trade with his wife. He had it. Leave Abraham alone. Let's redefine the basis of our Christianity here. We are fixing your foundation. You are still wondering yourself about the, the serpent. Does it look like a beast? Did it, was it a human being? Was it, leave serpent alone. Let's look at this. <laughs> Had seven sons and three daughters. Do you know how many conception is that? Without labor. Freely. You are worrying yourself with Eve. Hey. That's why you see some ladies. And hey, two is okay. They are going. They go and do bed control. Stop it. This one ten. Yes. And he had what it took to take care of them. <laughs> the God of Genesis chapter two is still pursuing you, madam. Oh. Let's continue. Okay, read verses four. And his sons went and feasted in their houses. Each one in his day. That means on each birthday. And sent and called for the three sisters to eat. Okay, read. For Job said, it may be that my son has sinned against God. And, and this job did continually. So, 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 even his giving offerings to God, even in his giving of offerings to God, he didn't give offerings to God because he loved God. It was because of what he presumed God would do to his children. This kind, loving God. He himself was thinking the wrong thoughts about God who was taking care of him. Where did this thing come from? Chapter 3. Read verses 25. Now, now, for the, read it carefully. One, two, go. For the things which are greatly feared. Pause. Did he say fear or feared? So it is in the past. That means he already had it. So he was a guy who was giving God an offerings out of fear that God would destroy his children. Yes, Satan was bragging about how God blessed him. So who was the problem here? God or Job? Job. There's a reason why we read this. It is very obvious, therefore, that Job was the one who introduced condemnation. To the children of Israel, according to the way Moses wrote the book of Genesis to them, God did introduce condemnation by giving them a law. But according to the writings of Job, Job is acknowledging, I did. I introduced condemnation. But the question is, what kind of condemnation did Job introduce? Self-condemnation. That's the point. Self-condemnation. So we can say in Genesis, God introduced condemnation through the commandment, but in Job, Job introduced what? Self-condemnation. And these are the two condemnations today. You are either self-condemned or you are condemned by breaking spiritual instructions. These are the two. See, let's see whether Satan even tried to even introduce condemnation. You get to see Satan did nothing. God and Satan did not even bring it. So, it is very true on both sides of the argument, either from the chronological perspective, that Satan did not introduce condemnation. The serpent that you are calling the Satan even was encouraging if you will be like God. Encouraging now. Right? Yes, sir. What was God's anger with the serpent? Have you ever cared to know? Would you like to know? Yes, sir. 
God's anger with the serpent was the fact that he was a friend to the woman. That's why God said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. But didn't God know that the serpent and the woman were friends? God knew. He said, but this friendship now has brought problem between this man. Where this man now no longer listens to me, but he listens to his wife. That's what we're asking you. Who have you been talking to? Who is your friend? Okay, so let's say, I, I don't talk to anybody. I keep to myself. Fine, you do, like Job, right? Yes. Why are you always suspicious that something will go wrong? Your children said they are going to the beach. Say, be careful, oh. Don't enter water. How can you go to the beach without entering water? Don't enter water. Did you watch the ABC News last night? They say one child drowned, oh, in, 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 in Coney Island, oh. When he went to the beach, dear God, one child, you are talking to a 21-year-old man. You are telling him he would drown in the beach. It was a child that they said drowned. How old was the child? Six years old. Six years old to 21. 21 said he would drive to the beach and go and drown him. He just entered the water and said, what a drown. <laughs> what a job spirit that he has. The fear. The fear that things will go wrong. You see, that's condemnation. Self-condemnation. The fear that things... Now, the children were celebrating their birthdays, having parties, having fun among themselves. Joseph said, they, they, they probably can curse God, though. Man, have you forgotten how you raised your children? And you will never read that they ever curse God. Job kept presuming, presuming, and his presumption made him become a victim to rumor. If you read that story carefully, where all the servants were telling Job that there was disaster, everything, they never stayed to see the last disaster. Job said, eh, the servants said, I escaped. I escaped. The building collapsed. Did you see the children die? I, I don't know. They must have died because the building collapsed. If you read it in context carefully, Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, you get to see nothing happened to Job's children. They never died. It was the servants running away, spreading rumor. And, and, and there's a verse of scripture. I think we've read it to you before. I think Job chapter 30. You get to see what Job later discovered. I, I think Job chapter 30. It's been a while since I read. I think Job chapter 30. Yes, Job chapter 30. Look at verses 1. This is what Job later discovered. Read verses 30. But now, they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have all disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. If you read it in context, in the Hebrew text, you discover that he was talking to... So all the, all the servants who came to tell him, he said, all of you, it is your fathers. Your fathers hate me. That's why they made you come and give me this rumor. He later discovered. But think about it between chapter 2 to chapter 30. Probably lasted several months or maybe years before he finally realized this thing was all set up. Because Job's children were not living with him. They all had their own houses in different places. And it's not like carrying like the mobile phone we have today where you can call. Yes, sir. Yeah. You only see them when they come. Yes, sir. How did he know that they always had parties? Because he knew their birthday. He gave birth to them. Yes, sir. Notice, he said one on each day, each one's day. So he knew, ah, it's birthday. This is what they don't they like birthday. This is my children now. When they are grooving their birthday, I know they will all meet. So all these things were born out of presumption. So oh, this you, your father has hated me. You, these children of dogs. You brought this rumor because you don't like me. Anyway, let, let's ignore that part. You know. But the point here, let, let's see something. 
Okay, let's go back to Job chapter 1. There's something. So why Job is giving God? Interestingly, Job will give God offerings. God is not even looking at the offerings. God is addressing another matter concerning Job. Why Job is still giving him offering. Read the next verse of verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Job, unto Satan, Where comest thou? Then Satan answered, The Lord answered, From going to and fro in the air, and from walking up and down. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Satan, has thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in all the earth? Now, notice. He was the most righteous man in the east. That's how Job wrote about himself. God is acknowledging. It was in the whole earth. Brother, this man is worth reading. When last, how often do you, you... Some of you don't like this book of Job at all. Because when you see Satan, you say, no, 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 God forbid. Mm -mm. You prefer Genesis with serpent and apple that you see. Meanwhile, this God, very innocent, loving. Job felt he was a self made man. See what Satan testified. Verses 9. <laughs> Mm, eh, see, no, 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 no. See the way you are sounding now. Are you his relative? Okay, now verses 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for no? So even Satan knew Job feared God. But Satan mis did not know that the fear Job had for God was not because of the blessings God blessed Job with. Job acknowledged that his fear was that his children would have caused God. But see what Satan said about the fear of Job. Even Satan did not know that the fear Job had was different from what he presumed. Oh, man. Wouldn't it have been better if, if Satan was correct? Satan was wrong here. Even Satan did not know the kind of fear Job had. Say, man, what kind of person is this one? <laughs> I told her it was because you blessed him. That's why he's afraid of you. I didn't know that he's afraid because that you will cause his children. <laughs> Even Satan was shocked. See, this guy is complex. So. <laughs> this job is twisted. <laughs> yeah. This job, who gave birth to you? Look at then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing? Has thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou, thou hast blessed the works of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But Satan did not know this is not the reason why Job fears God. And this is even a good reason to fear God. Satan was not complaining about it. He was not complaining. He's actually acknowledging. Lord, I've been good. I have, my information is very accurate. Very accurate. Very accurate. You see, where this was where Satan missed it. God laughed. I know why Job fears me, but you don't know Satan. You think because I blessed him. I did all of that, but he doesn't even know. Oh, man. If only you know how much God has protected you and you don't know. It's summertime now. You are going to one prayer house. And when you go now, they remove the hedge. No, it's summertime. They will press your bell, your doorbell. They will soon look for you. <laughs> Don't say it, the Lord. Put forth thy hand and touch all that he had, and he will cause thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he had is in thy power. Only upon him, himself put, forth, put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Can we tell you something? Yes, what Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord to do, he never did. Never did. Why? Because he was acting on the wrong information already. The real reason why Job crashed was his own fears and not Satan. 
So in this case, Satan was even innocent. Satan was innocent. God was even innocent. Job says, test. Touch him. Test him. Take what he had. Is that new? That's not new. Didn't God do it with Jesus? After receiving the spirit, he was led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. God, the spirit of the Lord took him to meet it to the devil. I said, devil. Oh yeah, I brought Jesus to you. So God did that. So what, what, what makes you think that what Satan said here was wrong? Satan knew that's how God does it. He will bless you, then he will test you. You don't know. <laughs> that catwalking shakwan was it. You don't know it was God who said, catwalk, let me see. Then your hair spinned. And she changed her hair color. And you know what red does to you, to your adrenaline. You now saw red hair, red, red color. She put red dye on her head. Hmm. With those big, big eyelashes. <laughs> You know, there are some eyelashes that can make someone's eyes big. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even a fly can perch on it. <laughs> can perch convenient, and you will not know. Because the thing is too big, you didn't feel it. It's super glue that is holding it. <laughs> <laughs> now they say they have magnetic eyelash. Yeah. And the magnet was strong enough to hold the, the butterfly. <laughs> All the time. I Even when the butterfly landed, very colorful, they thought it was a star. <laughs> oh. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job. Notice that. Those ones were having party. Just drinking and having fun. See. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Meanwhile, that was not true. They were just sitting in their house. Having fun. One of the servants wanted to spread the rumor. That's why he called them dogs. He later realized in chapter 30. He said, you young guys, your father has never liked me. Did you see the building collapse? The servant, it was just a setup. Amen. Look at it now. They were sitting in the house. And they came a messenger unto Job. Your children were plowing and all that. Nothing happened to the children. Said the Sibians fell. And this, this is nothing happened to the children of Job. They were there just having fun. One servant just ran and said, Let me go and tell Oga that something happened. Job began to curse himself. Nothing happened. Satan himself had not even reached where Job is there before. <laughs> this is why I was spreading rumor. Why? Because presumption. Once you live a life of presumption, you will become a victim to rumors. Rumors can destroy you faster than a bullet. If you are on the path of presumption. We'll continue. So much to say, but we'll continue. In our next class. Then we'll show you something about... We told you condemnation brings what? Debt. Right? But what kind of debt? Mm -hmm. Because there are two kinds of debt. There's what you call the first debt and the second debt. And the first debt is broken into two. What are they? We'll talk about that in our next class. You can, what we're trying to show you here in this lesson is you can settle it within you right now that you will live long. Be honest. Man. This is what kills people. When you live a life of presumption, you suffer self-condemnation. You are not sure to live long. God had to post Job of all of that to give him a new beginning. And he regained his children. 
Nothing happened to the children. It was just rumor. But traditional Christianity has believed it that something happened to Job's children. Now, but the focus here is, don't you like this kind of God? Right? Even when he told Satan, go, notice what he said. He said, don't tamper with his life. Why? Because if he, even if you make him lose everything, as long as he's alive, he will regain it more. And I'll still protect him again. Is this not the kind of God you would like? Or you want the one that will chase you out of your garden? You will use immigration. That, that God in Genesis chapter 2 will use immigration to pursue you. Now they are saying, go back to your country. I like this God of Job. I like this God of Job. And even Job challenged him. He said, Job, me. You challenged me. Where were you when I made everything? You mean, this is the guy who made everything. Yes. The one in Genesis chapter 2 made man and planted garden. But this is the real guy who made everything. He said, where, where were you when I made the whole earth? When I heard the foundations of the earth with the words of my mouth. He said that to Job. So this is the real guy. The one in Genesis chapter 2 had a garden. It was a house business in Genesis chapter 2. The children of Israel said they are my house. This one here, you are de dealing with a global matter. He said this is the most righteous man in all the earth. Let's broaden our scope. Yes, Don't live a race life. The God of Genesis chapter 2 was, was strictly a racist God to a, to a racial group. The children of Israel. But this guy here in Genesis, in Job, was a God of the whole earth. Dealing with a Satan who goes to and fro in the whole earth. Not one serpent that is by one tree. <laughs> Let's close. Because the whole thing is getting me angry now. Like, man, how did I fall for all this thing in the past? <laughs> I'll never suffer condemnation in my life. This is the best time to live, man. Because yeah. if you believe wrong, you live wrong, right? Yes, but I believe right. I believe right. I like this God of Job. I like this God of Job. Now let's even suppose Job lost everything as traditional Christianity says it. He made Job regain everything. But for Adam, the God that was dealing with Adam never wanted to see Adam again. It was curses everywhere. Curses. Curses. I like this God of Job. Thank God I'm not a Jew. I really thank God I'm not a Jew. So we say we are spiritual Jews. Okay, for you. <laughs> I like this one. You can be a Jew if you want to. It's okay. It's not a problem. I like, because I believe this God knew why he made me a non-Jew. He knew why he made me a non-Jew. If you wanted me to be Jew, to be Jewish, he would have made me a Jew. And I know it does not make mistakes. So I appreciate who I am. I don't have to be tracing blood whether I will have 45% <laughs> Jewish blood, 85% uh, Ethiopian. Now they say, ah, I, they later discover that my grandmother had 57% of Scottish blood. Wow. Why don't you just all become Jewish so that you can be wearing skirts and be a priest? Like the children of Israel wore The priests wore skirts. Because now this one that you are tying Jews to Scot Scottish, this thing. And their men wear skirts. Brother, just carry skirts. They will, can take you to Walmart, buy skirts and wear. Since everything about you now is <laughs> Jewish, Ethiopian, and Scottish. Brother, we are scared to. Have we? I'll be blowing pipe. <laughs> Blow pipe. Oh. But does it have to even be by blood? Even by birth, you can be a citizen. You, if your mother gave birth to you now in Israel, yes. meanwhile, your father is a stack Igbo with, with Mark here on the side, and your mother. Is even from Kemberi tribe. If you people go to Israel and give birth in Israel, that automatically makes that child a Jew by birth. What do you think that child will need to go and check her ancestry or he will bring you birth certificate? He will contest for election in Israel and win. 
You with 25% blood type, you are. <laughs> Why do sometimes when you see situations on Christmas, baby, you're like, can I ask you a question? Did you have a girlfriend? I do. Both of you don't have sense. <laughs> if only she knew. She was dating a senseless Nigeria was an idiot. <laughs> What of you really don't have this? Wow. So she's proud of you now. Wow. Speak Hebrew now, speak Hebrew. Hey, hala. From your mouth again. <laughs> <laughs> say it again, say it again. Oh. I'm following Rabbi this thing now. I'm one of his disciples. You know, people like that, you don't know how to explain them. You know, there are some people, you can see how they consciously made their lives complex. <laughs> you can't help them with simple matters. And you know, they can't. <clears throat> That kind of American Jew now that has traced his ancestry to 25% Jewish blood, who is more of a terrorist? That person is a chronic terrorist. Don't think, don't think the Jews, they trust that kind of person. They say, brother, you have a plan here. You better behave. Otherwise, we will send you to Gaza Strip where the Philistines will bomb your head, brother. <laughs> Sister Luna knows what we say. They will send you to Gaza Strip. You say you have 25% blood, but you come and live by the border of the Philistine. Be the first to receive the missile. <laughs> yeah, we met somebody recently. I said, Alpha. Alpha. I said, yeah, I've been in Israel for a while now. I said, yeah. So what's happening there? He said, I live there now. See you. You left America to go and stay in Israel. Brother, you like trouble. He said, what do you mean? I said, no, nothing. <laughs> See, you like trouble. People like that. I mean, if you, if you, except he lives in the main city, which is like New York, so it's very tight. But if you ever say you have a piece of land, I can be sure of where you live, Gaza Strip. They will give you those places because everything there is bomb will scatter it. <laughs> when toma tomatoes are growing, when it is time for harvest, you will see missile. <laughs> and it's amazing they call it Holy Land where missiles are flying everywhere. Even to and that's one part even those who go to, to Israel on tour don't get to tell you. That they actually can literally see a missile flying. They won't talk about that. They can't even take picture. Even when they go on tour, they say they like to see where Jesus was buried. They like to see where the water of baptism, where Jesus did baptism. As though Jesus was the only person that was baptized there. People have been baptizing in that water before Jesus came. So if you think that it is the baptism of Jesus that makes that place, people have been doing it before Jesus was born. Then one time the water went down, John the Baptist shifted base. <laughs> walk the street, Jesus walk. You can't walk the street, Jesus walk. Since 2000 years, you think it's still the same street? The sand has shifted though. <laughs> Walk the street. Just if you say you want to go there because of, well, for whatever reason, fine. It's up to you. But 
I'm not saying it's a bad place to go. Do you understand? What we're saying is that don't think being there is what really makes your Christianity authentic. You miss the point. That means God, God is the most confused person. That he didn't know how bad he wanted to really live in Jerusalem. He now, he now threw you to Ethiopia. See? That means if you get to heaven, you will challenge him. God, why did you do this to me? You posted me to Umunede, Umunede village when I wanted to, 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 to live in Galilee. I said, really? Okay, let's rewind. Let's start all over again. Go and live in Galilee. Galilee where Peter could not catch one fish. <laughs> Umunede, you can catch crab, fish, everything there. Peter could not catch water in the sea of Galilee. You say you wish you live in Galilee. Our papa was teaching today. He said, do not say that the former is better than the latter. I'm a success forevermore. I'm a success forevermore. I know I will never fail. Because the God of Job. Because the God of Job. Who happens to be the God of my father, Papa Joshua Aguila. Is my God. He's my God. He is my provider. He, my he brags about me. He does not condemn me. He is very proud of me. Yeah. This God was proud of Job. Job was condemning himself. Why this God was speaking volumes of him? You think God didn't know how Job felt about himself, but the Lord refused to see that. He said, this is my man. He's righteous. A man who condemned himself so bad, God said he's the most righteous man in the earth. God refused to change his views of Job. And when Job challenged God, God said, me, you challenge me. Me that has always been on your side, Job. Hey, who should have posted you to the garden or... Imagine if this Job was in, in the garden. You think you would have made it through? I love this God, man. I'm a success forever, bro. I will never fail in my life. Talk to the Lord. Bless his name. Bless